A very good evening and welcome. I'll say, thank you so much for this opportunity and uh, hello to the viewers. So what are, what are your thoughts about this? Just generally, you've recently come back home and I wonder what kind of um, mental space that puts you in. Sure. First of all, we welcome all of our brothers and sisters, the sons and daughters of Africa, who 400 years ago left the shore and they're now back. But let's be careful that they are not coming to impose but to propose mm. deals or things that we can do together. People like us, we left the country, came back, but we still have to consult what are some of the challenges and how can we take the overseas content, the QAT is, and contextualize it so that we meet the needs of our people, expand economic opportunities for all. So while we welcome our brothers and sisters, they must also not come just to tell but they must also come to sell. Well, they say they're coming back home. And uh, I mean, uh, you would know this having lived in the US. There's some who openly reject that heritage. Who There's some who come here and talk about the motherland, but there's some who absolutely refuse to have any linkage whatsoever to do with Africa and owning it. That is why I'm saying, you know, there's a wonderful verse in the Bible. It says, every good and perfect gift does not come from abroad, but it comes from above. In other, in other words, there will be those people who reject you, but as a leader, you've got to understand, it's like eating a fish. You get the meat and leave the bones. So there will mm. be those that are rejecting, but those that are genuinely, seriously coming back. Particularly the, or I don't say older, the mature you know, people who realize that they can add more value mm. in the development of Africa. Because whether we like it or not, the, uh, the growth of the world is in Africa right mm. now. So we'll talk about the development aspect, but they're also obviously also seeking something. Identity, understanding uh, their of historical uh, lineage, where they come from. Uh, what is in it for African Americans who obviously are struggling with some, what some say is a foreign land? Well, let's face it, in the United States, they don't fit. In, you know, so, uh, and they realize, as I said, the more mature they become, they want to go back to their roots. Some of them want mm. to be buried in Africa. So the key word there is identity. Remember, unless you know who you are, you'll never know who and what you can become. And where you're going. Exactly. So when they realize my identity, but the second, I think, most important thing is they have achieved success. Now they want to add significance. Mm. Because remember, success is what you do for yourself, selfish as we are. But significance is what you do for the next generation, the legacy piece. So most of my friends, African-Americans who are coming here, that identity and the legacy piece is what drive them, drive them to come and make a meaningful contribution here mm. in, the, in, in Africa. By development, what contribution do they feel they can make? We, we spoke about, in fact, you intimated it by saying you're back home now to give back. So sure. there's been a brain drain um, in South Africa. And I'll go into, the, I think, something like 23,000 qualified staff in 2015 that left this country. But th do we also equate that brain drain to a diaspora that's actually never lived here so that we will gain value from that and they're returning. Well, the, the bottom line is the whole world is getting crazy, you know, and now, unfortunately, we are faced with this thing called Fourth Industrial Revolution. As you know, I'm the president of the ICANN, Fourth Industrial Revolution. Mm. So the technologies that we have been exposed to overseas, now that we can take them, contextualize them for Africa, so with our African-American brothers together, we can now be able to use this technology to leapfrog so that we can give opportunities to our young people. The statistics, particularly in South Africa, are sad. I mean, so many percentage of our unemployed graduates now. Forget the unemployed youth, unemployed graduates. So now the African-Americans are saying, folks, you might have had brain drain, but brain uh, gain is now for us to work together and see how we can make a meaningful contribution. Number one, political freedom is great, but we now need economic freedom. You've heard me say it over and over again. I like the song, I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. But my song, I'd rather have Jesus plus silver and gold. So we need the fiscal silver and gold, but also need that creativity. Even though the fourth industrial revolution is here, there are still 
10 to 13 skills mm -hmm. that as African people, God has blessed us with so that we can add value not only to South Africa, to Africa, but also to the world. But it's also about governments incentivizing people to return home. I know Ghana has a big project like that trying to do that. But what do you say to people when you say you want them to give back, to develop Africa, to what end as well? Because the context also may be different sure. from when we talk about the 400 years of slavery, bearing in mind also that Africa is also guilty as being the, the one huge custodian of present day slavery. True. One in 200 people are enslaved in Africa. It's a fact, but again, history must teach us so that we don't repeat history. Mm. So the idea of the 400 years is, in these 400 years, what lessons are learned so that the next generation don't have to make those mistakes. But in that dialogue, the bottom line I'll say is we need economic freedom, rebata zaga, child health. We need to buy banks. We need to be involved in mining and agriculture. We need to be involved in infrastructure. We need to be involved in the fourth. Now it's gonna be the fifth industrial revolution. So again, using the brain gain from overseas, let us now see in Africa with the African context, with the African people, particularly the next generation of leaders, let's see how we can come together fast and accelerate the pace of change in our continent. Okay, so let's talk about that, Robert Lazak. Yes. The World Bank says if one in every 10 members of the diaspora is persuaded to invest 1,000 US, US dollars in her or her country of origin, Africa could raise 3 billion US dollars a year for development financing. That's quite a significant number. But are the emotional bonds there enough for them to be able to put up that kind of collateral? They can, but it's also our mistake here, South Africa and Africa. We don't market ourselves. Mm -hmm. Again, we have been mm -hmm. perceived as this dark continent and we need to change the narrative. Remember, unless the lions tell their own story, the hunters will always give us their own version. So we are equally to blame because we don't go there and specifically reach African Americans. I know the, home, uh, the homecoming events, particularly in South Africa, wonderful project going to Europe to bring in predominantly Caucasian or white South Africans to come home. But we still do not have that same effort, resource, money, and targeted you know, focus on bringing African Americans to invest in that. I'm privileged in that I know basketball players. They don't like the, the current administration in America. They want to invest, but when they come up here, it's difficult to open business here. The widening fiscal deficit here, so-called corruption, strikes and labor acts, whatever. So we need to change the narrative while they understand so challenges are there. So what do we do differently there. in our social marketing then? Bottom line, we're not doing well. We need to sharpen, and one way again is civic society, our government, we are encouraged by our president, uh, 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 Cyril Ramaphosa and his administration, that we need to accelerate that. Three billion dollars a year. I promise you it can make a lot of difference. So there are specialized units and ministries in 32 African countries already in order to engage the diaspora. But there obviously needs to be a change in those engagement policies. Correct. What should be foremost? I just came from Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana, and Swaziland. I spoke about the five Ps. Number one, political will. It's not easy. Leadership is not easy. But for us to have that paradigm shift to make sure that we really achieve this growth rate that the 33 out of 48 countries we have, number one, political will. But number two, policies. I'll say people have got policies, we now need to implement. Policies are fantastic. So political will, policies, number three, partnership. The private-public partnership are needed. I know right now we're still struggling with unions, whatever, but whether we like it or not, the third P is important. Number four, pricing for any product that we, get, we, we involve ourselves in. But number five, which is supposed to be number one, it's about people. Remember, people first. As long as we've got people, all the political will, policies, whatever, will follow. So those five Ps, if we can just for the next decade focus on those five Ps, I promise you there'll be some visible change in this wonderful continent. Dr. David Mulabo, a very bigger, wider discussion that we should be having. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's take a quick break. Don't go away. Welcome back here to African Perspective with 
still discussing the 400th anniversary of slavery and looking at the door of our return in collaboration with Pan-African Parliament Project is to bring back home uh, leaders of the diaspora. And of course, we're talking about the bigger picture with Dr. David Mulapo, what it means uh, integrating members of the diaspora back into Africa, especially for Africa's development. And one of the things that, and we were speaking about the five key areas that you think that we should be concentrating on. But I think also part of it should be better integrating members of the diaspora if they're coming home, not as foreigners, but also not as locals who are imposing themselves. So how do we do that? Well, three ways. One, get closer to the local people. Again, every time leaders come in and forget we're supposed to be seven leaders. Seven leaders mean you feed the sheep, you don't feed the giraffe. So when we come up with this entitlement thing, I know it, I got a PhD, I've passed high school with difficulties, I'm more educated than you already miss the people. So number one, get closer to the people. Listen, because you can't listen while you're far. Then number three, let's begin to, okay, here are the local solution, global solution. How can we make sure that these solutions work for all of us? Because at the end of the day, there must be a win-win situation. Even if I invest, there must be some social mm. cohesion, social responsibility. We need to make some money. But remember, as I said, legacy is what is important because, you know, what am I leaving behind? That's what people want. Because you can be a billionaire, but if you're leaving absolutely nothing, there's nothing that's going to be remembered about you, whether you're from the diaspora or locally, whatever. So listen, get closer to the people, listen with your heart and not with your head, and be, be prepared to shift your mindset and at the end of the day, let's have a win-win situation. So you spoke about Africa's bad PR in the past, and I don't know if it's entirely in the past. What are you leaving behind? If you speak to a lot of youth in Africa, they 70% of the demographics of this continent, what are they getting as a legacy? A lot of them don't have work. A lot of them don't have opportunities. A lot of them are not invited into those policy uh, design and implementation spaces or political participation? Fortunately, I'm blessed in that I have been director of many companies, multi-million dollar companies, listed companies. So as I can for the Industrial Revolution, we're already in 28 countries focusing on youth development. We've got a program for youth in school, youth out of school and unemployed youth. What do we do? We get some of our partners, local and overseas, begin to expose them starting to change their mindset that this thing of going to school so that you can get a job those days are gone intrapreneurship and entrepreneurship are now the name of the game the fourth industrial revolution there are no CETA accreditation whatever we need to leapfrog so right now as we speak in South Africa more than 10,000 jobs are available in the banking sector but we do not have the young people to fill those spaces in because our educational system our curriculum is not readily available for us to feed the program. So what do we do? It's all about disruption. So how do we disrupt some of the organizations that we work with? To just take two young people, give them, whether you call it internship, whatever, get them opportunities to be hands-on, mentor them, coach and mentor them. It's one way of passing the baton. So I can safely say that in 28 countries, we are making an incredible difference. Between now and December, we've got homecoming events of more than a thousand African Americans. They're coming in drips and drabs, 40, 500, 100, whatever. So you'll be hearing about the kind of stuff that we are doing. So it's not theory, it's practical stuff. They come up here with due respect. We meet little of government people. We need to go directly to the people. Mm -hmm. We thank God for the trade delegations. I've done hundreds of trade delegations. They have not yielded anything. So right now, while we respect trade delegations, let's go straight to giving these wonderful young people opportunities. So philanthropic um, efforts can take us so far. Somebody would talk about uh, Oprah Winfrey, a well-known sure. um, and, and very influential actor in, in, in such projects, even here in South Africa. But if you look at the circumstances of African Americans back home, there hasn't been much change. So if we're going to talk about skills transfer, for instance, for members of the diaspora, I mean, say, from the U.S. to here in South Africa. What are we going to learn from them if their political situation has not changed? Let me give an example. A, an organization like African Bank, you know, they went through a mess. They've now, you know, owned by other people. 
they have partnered with people like I can to say, okay, guys, practically, let's get some of these high school kids, get them into the banking space immediately. Again, philanthropy is great, but what if each and every organization, just like the National Development Plan, mm. 20 or 30% of every deal, government deal, must be uh, geared towards youth development, women. If we can just implement those things, I'll say, that's all we are saying. But we cannot wait for government, I repeat. We cannot wait for government. So it's up to us as capitalists, small, medium enterprises, as uh, people who know other people, whatever, to be able to disrupt the system and begin to get some of these young, young people so that they can get into the mainstream of what we call the corporate world or entrepreneurship thing so that we can fast track them. And thank God with technology, we are already doing it. We thank God for the pockets of excellence, but if all of us were to do this thing so that they own part of these companies. So as we begin to give them internship program, give them practical stuff, but they own these particular organizations, because at the end of the day, they will be running these organizations But that should anyway. also mean the existence of infrastructure, because if, for instance, we're talking about a, a, a more digitized world. Yes. That means you also have to change your thinking and approach. If you're starting somebody from a primary school to start thinking within the context of the fourth industrial revolution and the future of work, but we lack that. But as I can, we're already ahead of the game. We are right now working with life orientation educators. We call them career guidance teachers. The government is not giving us a cent. You can't wait for government. You go in and introduce uh, what we call AVR, you know, the whole uh, virtual reality stuff. Now from ECD level, early childhood development, mm. the retired nurses, the retired educators, you, you'll be surprised. You come in, reskill and upskill them, suddenly they crash. Now our young people, they're not scared. Kids are not scared. No, they, don't have, they are not technophobia. They may be BBT, born before technology, but that's how you do that. While we thank God for your regular curriculum, but the, to disrupt this system is you start with ECD, Start with rural, rural, rural areas. All we need now is that data thing because the spectrum is important. We need to load that data so that even when we in introduce the, five, uh, the fifth industrial revolution or the 5G, we can be able to do mm. something. ICANN is already doing that. So I cannot speak on behalf of other people because we're realizing careers of the future, our parents. Now, right now we can't get, give jobs to young people who are coming from universities. So what are we saying? Universities are really becoming null and void. So we only need a small percentage. Let's begin to focus on TVET colleges. At least there we've got 80% of theory, 20% of practical work. The students are right there. So let's begin to disrupt things, begin to partner with TVET colleges, begin to partner with uh, high school, begin to partner with primary schools and ECDC, uh, ECD uh, educational centers. We're already doing that. But you can't say... I can't speak for other individuals because th that is the crux of the matter sure. that we need to develop individual and wider networks that are going to enable people in the diaspora and people on the continent to be able to do the kind of work that you're doing as I can. The challenge is that we have tried, my sister, and the problem with government, this red tape, why is it called even red tape? Why not a white tape or a green tape? Anyway. Ray tape with government. We've, we've been burned so many times. You come mm -hmm. in, what's in it for me? It is so discouraging because of the level of corruption. What's in it for me? It is a wonderful project. We can partner. Most of the time, we don't even need money from government. We need the existing infrastructure. We need to work within the in, in existing infrastructure. But you've got to pay toll gates all the time. It becomes frustrating. Mm. The beautiful part about technology, you now come to a point where you get people who are already doing stuff, plug them in. So the people from the diaspora, that's what they are wanting. David, forget all this red tape stuff. Where is it that we can plug in? There are a lot of NGOs, NPOs who are doing wonderful work. So let, instead of reinventing the wheel, let's begin to collaborate. That's the language of the fourth industrial revolution. Part of where you would yes. start then is recognizing that some of these units that these countries have set up in order to facilitate these relationships suffer from dire understaffing and underfinancing. Isn't that where the diaspora then also comes in? But when they come in, let's be sure that the government make it easy for us to do the kind of business. Mm. Example, we will fund this particular thing. If you're understaffed, let us get some volunteers with money who will be able to come in for three years, five years, at no cost for them to come in. When they come in, it's politics again. How can governments be more proactive? Um, we know that there's already, if we talk about the African Free Continental Trade yes. Agreement, 
how else can they be more proactive? Let the governing people create an environment for business people to do business, for the NPO to thrive, whatever. Just let government people back off, create that space so that there's little regulation so that people, business people know how to work with business people. NPOs know how to work with business people and government. So if they can just give us that leeway, not only talk, but apply what they're talking about, create those opportunities and allow us to collaborate. The problem is synergy. Everybody's working on their own silos. We need to come together and stop this talk shop. I'll say we are sick and tired of another seminar in Africans. On the Zielte Malnar met seminars. You know, all the seminars, we've got all the case studies, we've got all the findings. It's now time for implementation, implementation. But isn't there a huge elephant in the room that we're ignoring, that as much as African governments would have the political will to uh, synergize all of these projects, there's also the historical impediments that lie within the infrastructure of Africa as it is, within its borders and with its relationship with its colonizers. True. But again, the number one PR said is political will. Because we cannot always just blame the colonizers. stuff. We need to disrupt, do what we need to do. Example, I was one of those guys who was controversial. Why do we need tenders? The government right now, we're talking about the national health insurance. Why must you even be talking about it? X amount of money is irregulated, so why don't you just go ahead Make sure the system works. Give black people, the lawyers. I mean, right now, women lawyers in this country are saying men are getting all the best jobs. There are some sharp minds. I'm talking about, some, forget the diaspora. Local advocate and lawyers, they're not giving opportunities. And there's X amount. So what do we do? Every time as a black government, we still go back to our colonizers. So again, but it's as I if we don't believe. That because you know, some yes. of that development funding comes from that. It comes with constraints, comes with constrictions, and you have to adhere to some of those. Some of those, but still as a country Most can say we those. don't. No, but you can just say we don't take this. Remember, there are some other monies that are not, that, 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 that are not tainted, that do not have any restrictions. Because we cannot talk about development and then still, we still have to go back to the colonizers then we'll still be slaves, like you said, forever. We so can't afford that. Our young people are impatient. We cannot afford that same old system where we grew up, you know, to go like this. Those days are gone. So those who are coming to Africa in commemoration of 400 years of slavery, are they coming to a free Africa? Can they say that we are truly free and free of slavery and um, all the characteristics thereof? We are free politically. Like I said, we... We may be in government, but we, we, don't, we don't have the power. The bottom line is what Nelson Mandela said many, many years ago, and Tabun Begi tried to push it. It's all about economic freedom. There's a verse in the Bible that says, money answereth all things. If we can deal with this economic stuff, then we can even change the, 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 the future of Africa. All right, Dr. David Mlapo, thank you very much for joining us and uh, speaking to us. And